الحمد لله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you so much my Rajan and um, everyone at Peace Chairs for uh, extending the invitation on this very very important topic um, I also want to thank you for getting me to finally uh, get this book I've heard so much about this book over I don't know how ever since it was probably released from a lot of different people um, who had mentioned that it's just for every parent every educator they need to read this because it really unearths uh, what's happening with our society, with our world. And if you recall the last Ed Fontes that I did here with Sister Heba, we addressed the issue of post-modernity. And it's very much tied to this topic. So I did as much as I could in the time I had a deep dive. I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't read the whole book, but I, what I read from it was just hitting all the, the, the marks for me because it was connecting the dots in many ways. You know, this long debate of nurture versus nature right uh, what how you know what what is really the impact on the human being uh, is it environmental is it you know you know is it something that we you know we're just kind of born and raised with like all these discussions that often occur around the topic of of children child rearing uh, faith um I think are addressed, uh, you know, at least in terms of what we're again witnessing in our society unfolding with our children. Because I've done so many parenting sessions, and this topic comes up all the time. Like, what right. happened? What's going on? Why am I having such a difficult time? I didn't have these issues growing up, and so we have to first and foremost accept that yes, the world has really transformed a lot, and it's because there are ideas that are divorced from faith and tradition, which you know, th there's been a long-standing history of really trying to infuse or imbibe certain principles in, in, in children or in, you know, members of society about, you know, being stoic, being resilient, not falling apart at the first sight of hardships and, and difficulties and challenges. But when you're rooted and you have a faith that anchors you, right, and, mm -hmm. and a belief system that helps to uh, answer or at least give you some consolation, you know, uh, with regards to challenges and difficulties. It's a lot easier to to move forward and find that that strength. But when you take faith out of the equation entirely, which is what we've seen in the past how many decades, right? Um, you know, they, they've really tried very hard, and they are in many ways succeeding to erase the concept of, for example, something as that is inherent in our faith, which is part of the six articles of faith, right? That we believe in qada, right? In qadr. We believe that there is divine will and that there are certain things that are, you know, that, that are, uh, you can't really necessarily change, but there's wisdom in them, right? So we have this concept that answers a lot of these unknowns where as when you deal with, you know, people who have no faith or no, no no faith that again grounds them or gives them those answers, then they try to seek meaning in their own limited ways, right? And so that's what we've seen is that this direction of our world and our society away from God, away from meaning, away from interpreting events that are unfolding with a metaphysical lens, right? With a lens that is beyond the world because the, yeah. the, the, the worldly lens is limited. We don't have all the answers to everything, but when we, you can say that, you know, there is a divine purpose, there is divine will, there is more to life than just this material world, and at some point, inshallah, we will have answers, that in and of itself provides clarity, provides calm, provides a lot of just tranquility in the individual. But again, our society is, is moving in a direction away from that, so what happens is you gotta have, you gotta kind of have, you know, something to, to, to I guess, um, fill that void, and what's happened is, feelings have taken over, right? The, the conversation around, you know, feelings versus intellectual rationalization that makes sense is where is what why this book is so relevant. Because nowadays, no, we're not rationalizing. We're not seeking meaning. We're just reacting. Mm -hmm. We're in a reactive state. Life happens, things are happening. And so, you know, everybody is now in, in, in a state of just feeling and then processing whatever's happening with feeling and that is at every level of our society we're seeing that right where that's why this book is mm -hmm. highlighting things that are really important for us to understand like what you know when it when it's talking about 
you know, the untruths, but also what we're seeing, for example, in academia, right? We're seeing discourse shut down, mashallah, Brother Ali's here. We're seeing, um, you know, debate shut down. We're seeing, you know, even, even the intellectuals of our society have fallen prey to this mindset that if something, if I, if, if I don't feel uh, right about something or something doesn't align with my feelings, then I uh, have the right to prioritize my feelings as, as opposed to what is in the common, you know, or in the interest of, of the collective. So there's this entitlement. There's this, there's a lot of just really, um, again, unfortunately, very harmful, uh, you know, patterns that have emerged because of these ideologies and these ideas that are, again, from our faith perspective, completely divorced from faith. So there's so much to say, and I know I didn't exactly answer your question, because I do have a lot to say about Islam and Islam's position on resilience and what our deen teaches us. But, mashallah, now that we have Brother Ali here, I think um, it would be wonderful, because we were initially going to start off the discussion trying to just, again, um, introduce the, the concepts in the book, and because, mashallah, Brother Ali has more experience in the space of his, uh, as a therapist and in the schools, and really works a lot with youth, um, he was going to begin our discussion and just share, you know, some of the observations you've had, and then we'll get into the Islamic perspective on these topics and how Islam addresses, you know, really infusing in children um, the, that, that fortification that they need to be able to manage and regulate themselves and handle the bombardment of challenges in this world, which is 100% rooted in, in faith, but is an ideal, is, a, is an intellectual process. It's, it's something that, it, it's not rooted in emotions, it's rooted in understanding, right? Uh, and, and so it's a reasoning that we, uh, that we approach these things with reasoning, whereas we're in the world of feelings right now. So now oh, I will, sure. Bismillah, I welcome you, Brother Ali, how are you? Very good, mashallah. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> So. Please forgive me for my tardiness. Uh, if anyone knows me uh, or anyone knows my wife, one thing that I do not like is being late. <laughs> so uh, it was a long day at work today. Um, so go into feelings. I have to ground myself with my feelings. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so uh, I, I um, well, first of all, subhanAllah, there's so many familiar faces of parents that I see out there. And, and uh, I just want to thank you all for taking the time out um, away from your families and just away from your children, actually. So I, I, I have to commend you to kind of give yourself that space. Um, and that's one thing that as a clinical um, therapist, what I do is I often talk to my, my parents um, about what do you do outside of your children and what does your lives look like. And, and for all of you to be here, that's just actually really amazing to see. And I, I, I expected a good turnout, but I didn't think we would have such a good turnout, so mashallah. Um, I actually, the book is uh, right up my alley. So for those who may not know me, I am a licensed clinical therapist and I am positioned at Newark High School. And so I'm there full time. And so I'm working with our students uh, at that high school Monday through Friday, um, sometimes longer days like today, um, with a lot of uh, different emotions that they're going through, different kind of life obstacles that they're trying to manage. Um, anywhere from anxiety, which we'll probably delve into a little bit, um, depression, uh, grief and loss. Um, we're looking at relationship issues, and they could be peer, family, or otherwise. Um, one of the models that I use, uh, one of the modalities that I use, I try not to use too many clinical words, uh, one of the uh, evidence-based practices that I use is cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which the author of The Coddling of the American Mind, um, the two authors, uh, they do a really good job as far as using that and extracting some of that information and trying to help the reader understand where the feelings are coming from, how to navigate those. Um, but it really kind of comes through the thoughts that we think or the thoughts that our children think. And, and, and I actually teach this uh, quite a bit with a lot of my students. Um, so I just wanted to, if it's okay, I'd like to have some takeaways. I want to give you some of my takeaways. And just by a show of hands, and, and there's not putting anyone on the spot, but who has, a ha who has had a chance to either glean through or read thoroughly through the book itself? Just so I can get an idea of those who might, okay. So I might go into a little bit uh, deeper detail of what the authors are presenting. 
And um, so hopefully that will kind of help you along when you actually get through the book or just get to the book. Um, it's a very straightforward book. So it's not um, beyond the, really the high school reading uh, equivalent. So it's not very hard. It's a very easy read. Um, and, the, and the authors do a really good job of storytelling uh, as, long as, as well as uh, putting forth things that you can actually take away and, and hopefully um, use, you know, as you're raising your children. So um, I wanted to just kind of read and then I'll put my own thoughts. Is, can I, yeah, would course. it be okay if I can have the floor for just of like a few minutes? Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Very good. So uh, I'm going to read a little verbatim uh, directly from the text and then I'll give my, uh, my own little thoughts on that. So yeah. basically the two authors are, are, are really kind of looking at high school children below. Um, so any, anything under that. But actually, the beginning of the study, they actually went into the college setting, so the university setting. And so what they were finding is um, it was a situation where there was a program that was put on. It was a, a, a kind of a heavier debate where um, feelings were kind of like kind of out of control because of the speakers that were being presented and the topic that was being presented. And I'll save that as a surprise if you guys delve into the book. It's in the first chapter or so. And they were, uh, they made a quote unquote safe room um, for um, parents or students or staff even that might have been triggered by the, the, the discussion, right? And so the authors um, actually saw this and they were just kind of very curious, like, wow, how fragile some of our adults are, right? Not necessarily the children, but it was kind of like looking at the adults. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's very weird because in the clinical therapy part of it, I, 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 we talk about safe rooms and, and things like that, but I think he was showing the extreme of it, right? And so he, that's where it kind of starts. And it just kind of starts where, where thoughts and feelings begin. So um, he said, many university students are learning to think distorted in th distorted ways. And so that's where it starts. And so I find that oftentimes with my students and even my staff, I work with my teachers, um, and it's, it's their thoughts and how they think about the situations and the environment that they're put in or placed in and, and how they think. And then, and then all of a sudden, those thoughts, there's behavior behind it. So um, that's kind of where the authors are going. And then it, it, it continues on that there's a culture of uh, what they call um, safetism, right? And so um, it has produced institutional practices that have overreached the goals of protecting children from harm and undermine our ability to solve important social problems. So as I'm looking through my notes, I wanted to just talk about my high school students. And one of the things that I'm, I'm preaching to my, my teachers, like I have a lot of students that come out of the classroom because they have anxiety. And uh, so I'll give you an example of test anxiety. So that's, that's a big one, right? So. I'll get a teacher, they'll call me up and they'll say, well, the student is just out of control. They have all this anxiety and they, they just need to see someone, right? And so that's kind of that escapism. So they, they, they run to my office and they're, and they're just breaking down. They're in tears. They're shaking. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's kind of going on. I thought maybe there's, a, there's an argument with the parent or there's an argument with a peer or, or maybe there's some kind of other thing going on, but it's just a... It's just a test. It's just a quiz. Or it's just something like that that's kind of going on. And all of a sudden, um, I start kind of breaking down where the, where the student is. And so one particular student, I'm like, OK, what's happening? What's going on? Well, I didn't. So they'll say that I didn't prepare enough for the test. I said, OK. And then we'll say, OK, well, what else? Right. You didn't prepare enough for the test, so you're going to take the test anyway. I can't. Well, why not? Well, I'm going to fail the test. Okay. Failure is part of learning, right? And, uh, well, what happens if you fail the test? And then all of a sudden, they escalate. They escalate the negative thoughts. So the negative thoughts start rushing through. And their thoughts of, I'm going to fail the test. I'm going to fail the class. And now I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail school. And then they, they, they frame it as, I am a failure. And so my job as a, as a, as a therapist is to back them down or what I call walk down the walk down the staircase because now they've escalated to the point where now physically 
they're reacting to their thoughts and feelings, where now we're seeing physical symptoms of shaking and crying and um, all of this kind of getting out of control. So we I walk them down. I say, well, first of all, let's, let's look at the test. What is the test on? So it's on chapter 24. Okay. How long is the test? Well, it's 25 questions. If you fail the test, hypothetically, you fail the test, what's your grade currently? I have a B. I said, okay, so logical. Is it, is it F on this particular test going to give you an F in the overall grade? And then they start to start to think and reason and understand. And like, no, it's, it's not going to bring my B down to an F. Okay, great. Okay, now. If it's not going to bring your B down to an F, it might impact your grade a little bit. So now, what, so we start to problem solve. So that, that is kind of like the core of it. We have to get their fears and anxieties kind of calmed down so we can start thinking rationally. And so that's where the kind of the book is kind of going. And so I'll, I'll continue on. It, they talk about the three untruths um, early in the book. So the, the two authors, they come up with three untruths. So untruth number one, the untruth of fragility. So they use this model. I'm not, I'm not necessarily fond of it, but their, their words is, if what doesn't make you, I mean, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Now, I don't know if you've all heard, what doesn't kill you make you stronger, right? But that's the premise that they want you to take, but I guess they're, they're saying that they've heard this one. But really, it's, I have an example, and I see this a lot. I lost a friend, therefore, I will never find another. And I will no longer be a good friend. So I'll, I'll, I had this one particular instance where two friends, junior high, they come into high school, and they had a falling out. And then all of a sudden, this argument happens, and all of a sudden, they catastrophize it. That's what we call it, you know, just making something small out of this huge thing, right? And now all of a sudden, uh, they're no longer friends, and now I'll never make another friend ever. And so I have to, we talk about logical and illogical, right? So I have to break it down. I have to kind of bring them back down the ladder again because their thoughts are now turning into beliefs. And, and I'll get into where the, the, uh, the authors kind of think or actually describe how thoughts become beliefs and, and cognitive behavioral therapy talk about this. So if you think something, therefore you'll start to believe it, and then therefore you'll see the action or result behind your beliefs, right? So the second one is the untruth of emotional reasoning. And so they said to always trust your feelings. And so that's, that's the untruth. You shouldn't, shouldn't always trust your, your gut feeling. And you'll hear this a lot with adults. Um, we might say, well, I feel it in my gut, and I know it. That's what I should do. And, and we go on this, what they call gut instinct, right? And, but this, this could be false. This could be not, a, not necessarily a, a good thing to actually do or even teach your children. You know, should, you should react on your, your gut instinct because it might be a false thing to do. So that was, that's the second untruth. And then the third untruth is the, un, the untruth of us versus them. And uh, I, this, is, this one hit home with me a lot, and so it's basically separation of groups. And we find this in politics, especially in the political environment that we've been placed in over the last, say, 10 years, right? We, we want to shelter, and we want to contain our children from, from feeling bad or feeling, you know, upset, and we want to care for them. We want to put them in a kind of a plastic bubble, kind of saying, and we don't want them to experience pain, right? So we want to rescue them. So the authors say, and I also say this with my parents as I work with my parents and my students, it's going to be okay. When you learn, you're going to fail. You're going to have many failures. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the things that I do in my office, and I love chess. Chess is one of my favorite of all times. There's a lot of lessons that can be extrapolated from chess. And the game of kings when you start learning, you will lose. It's a complicated game in the very beginning. And I often teach, and I have friends from all over the states, I'll teach over the phone. But the first time I'll teach them, I'll say, you're going to lose. That's the first thing I tell them. You're going to lose, and you're going to lose a lot. Do you still want to play? Sure, let's teach me how to play. So I have a guy, I have a guy from Alabama that I have been playing chess with over the phone for about a year now. 23 losses in a row. And I said, how's your resilience? So I'm, I'm going to beat you. I said, that's the, that's the attitude I'm looking for. 
and he did. He finally, he finally won a game, and he, I'm telling you, that made his whole life just beating me one game. And then after that, I crushed him five more times after that. But, um, <laughs> and this is something that I learned in, in play therapy. So very early on in my education, I was, I was trained in play therapy. And my clinical psychologist who trained me in play therapy, she set me up in elementary school. And um, she, she taught me different kind of ideas about play therapy. And I didn't know this particular idea. And one of my little guys wanted to play uh, board games. That's all he wanted to do is play board games. And I would just let him win. And I didn't, I didn't think twice about it. We play and, and then I would just find a way to lose or just let him be happy because he took a lot of joy in it. So I'm going to pause just for a second as the event goes. Bismillah. So um, just to kind of pick up where I was at. So play therapy. I'm working with this little guy and he loves playing board games. And so I would, I would just find ways to lose to make him happy. So I thought that that was, that was a good thing. And so part of my clinical training is I have to review each and every student that I'm working with. And so my clinical supervisor sits down and we go over each of the children that I'm working with. And so I, I get to telling her about the, my little guy. He, he only wants to play board games and and that's okay. And this is what we call structured play. So we have structured play and free play. Free play uh, is quite different, uh, but structured play is more with the rules, right? And so um, she was asking me about, it. does he abide by the rules? Uh, does he cheat? Do you know, they hide things or try to make you... And no, no, he's doing all good there. Um, and and uh, she said, uh, how often does he lose? And I'm like, he never loses. And I'm like, well, she's like... Well, he never loses. I say, wow, he's pretty good at these kind of games. And I said, well, I purposely let him win. And she said, well, why is that? And I said, well, because it makes him happy. And he gets a lot of joy out of this. And she goes, well, I want to talk to you, but like, that's not necessarily a good thing. And so she wanted to let me know that there's life lessons that has to be used in, in, in play, in play therapy. And part of that is, is losing and learning how to deal with the emotions of, of losing. And so I said, okay. So she, she, she gave me an assignment. She said, the next time I want you to play and I want you to do your best to win. And, of course, you know, next time we played. And she wanted to know how he reacted, how he responded. And sure enough, the next time we play, I think it was shoots and ladders or something weird. And so sure enough, I, he, went, he loses. And he had a fit. He just had. He was. He was eight years old. And just he. I, he took the board. And he kind of threw it off the table. All the pieces flying. He got up and he said, "I don't want to play anymore." And he went off in a chair and pouted for a while. And I was like, "Wow." All right. So now I need to process with him. So that's the key, right? So I needed to work and work with him. So anyway, with that being said, I, I talked to my clinical supervisor, and, and she said, "You need to look to help him through those emotions, because now we need to extract what does he think of himself." Right, because it's all about thoughts versus feelings, and that's that's kind of where the authors are going with this. So, long story short, I had to continue to play with him this way, and and I found some rigidity with his willingness to want to play these type of games anymore, and and I would have to encourage him, no, come on, come on. And then it's about teaching as well. So there's a teaching aspect of learning, and so whenever you're finding a child, your child who's having difficulties or struggling or getting angry or upset, those are the feelings, right? And they're, they're turning into action. I'll get into that in a little bit. But the teaching aspect is probably one of the most keys because the authors are, are saying that in order for a child to grow and develop in, in, in a healthy way, in an independent way, they have to learn, adapt, and grow. And, and they, they kind of go into the brain and the consciousness and how the, the brain is still growing. And it will be growing into the early 20s, you know. Um, but at a tender age of 8, 9, 10, and 11, uh, there's cognitive processes that are developing. And the neurology is a little bit deep. But in all reality, it all comes down to teaching, learning, so they can grow and adapt. So that's another part of the book that I, I really found. And... I'll be honest, I, I haven't read the entire book, but I can't, I can't put it down. So 
I will, I will now finish the book. So thank you, Hamira, for, for even bringing this book to my attention because I, I, was, I was not in, in the know. So I, d I don't want to over... Are we good? Okay, okay. So I want to get into something I'm, I'm passionate about. It's, it's the modality. It's the clinical practice that they're looking at. It's, it's the cognitive behavioral therapy. And so the basic definition, it's an intervention that focuses on challenging and changing unhelpful thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes and behavior, improving emotional regulation. Um, this, this is very key. I'll stop there, there. The emotional regulation is where my high school students are struggling. So I, I, I'm actually... I give sugar to a law that I'm in a high school situation where I'm dealing with students from the ages of 14 to 18. And I've been, mashallah, I've been there for now uh, seven years. And I'm, I'm finding that my young adults are not being young adults. And so a lot of the work is helping them understand and adapt to being a young adult. Because that, that very critical age of four years, from 14 to 18, in, in all sense, in all, you know, kind of sense of the things here in the United States, 18, you're considered an adult. And the parental rights are now waived. So now, adult, uh, now uh, the parents are like, well, you're 18, you need to get out, and you need to take care of things yourself. And we're finding that our 18-year-olds are not prepared for this. And, and so... I, I notice this, and I try to find my freshmen, and, and I get them early as soon as I can get them, and I'll ask them, who wakes you up? What do you mean? Mama wakes me up. Oh, you're 14 years old, and you don't get up on your own? No, my mom gets me up. And I will say more than, more than most of my students, parents are doing this. So that's, that's safetyism, right? I don't want to make sure you're not late, honey, so I'm going to wake you up. I'll get you up, and I'll cook you breakfast, and I'll take care of this, and I'll get your books together, and... And, I, and I, I dissect, I'll ask questions, right? But it's, it's about what I want to talk to my parents about is we got to get them to become adults. And how do we do that? We have to teach. So when they're on their own, when they're in college, and I assume, I'll just take a poll real quick. For all those in the audience who have children that they hope and shall love will go to university. Okay. The majority of the hands, if not all the hands, went up. And that's, that's fantastic, mashallah. <coughs> the chances of your child living at home might be slim to none. There's some universities that require on-campus um, dormitory uh, stay for freshmen. Not all, some. And so then if your child goes to uh, a, a, like UC Santa Barbara or UC Davis or... Sacramento State, where my, I did my bachelor's degree. They're not close enough, so they have to be on campus. They have to be on dorm. So if they're on dorm and they're 18 now, they have to become adults. Okay, they, have to be, they have to get themselves up on time. They have to make sure they're doing their homework. They have to make sure they can cook, or at least you know, rudimentally kind of cook, and, you know, just basic things. They have to make sure they're showering, and they're dressing, and they're using deodorant, and the hygiene's correct, and they're brushing their teeth. And all of these things, but if our parents have created this safetism where we're doing everything for them, and now they're away from mom and dad for the first three months, it's going to be very hard for them to adapt from parents keeping everything safe and whole to now I have to do everything myself, and how do I manage that? I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm upset, and then again we go back to the thoughts and then how they feel about them, how, how they feel about themselves. I can't cook for myself. I can't eat. Therefore, I'm a failure. I can't do this. And then we get into this failuristic kind of mindset. So as my parents, as I sit in front of you, one of the things that I really re request is you start training your, your, your children to kind of be independent. Teach them how to cook. Get them an alarm, not their cell phone. Uh, get them alarm that they could get up on their own if if they're getting up in the 12, 13, 14 year old. It's time for them to kind of stand up. So when frustrations handle or, or happen or, or they're confronted with some obstacles, now they 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 have a little bit more that that inner strength in them that hey I I can do this. 
I don't need mom there. I don't need dad there. I can, do, I, I can manage. And it starts very small. And with my students, it starts with just getting up. And then it starts about going to bed on time. You know, do you have to be told to go to bed? Or do you know what time your bedtime is, right? And so it's just these little things. So going back to the cognitive behavioral aspect of it. So what, it, what cognitive behavioral therapy really kind of gets into is automatic thoughts. So when something happens, you will have a thought about it. If an earthquake happens, what's your first thought? What's that automatic thought? Am I going to die? Is, is, am I going to go through, fall through the earth, Allah forbid? Or is my child safe? Am I safe? Is my home safe? Am I on a fault? Where did it happen? You know, so all of these automatic thoughts start rushing in. And some people have these automatic thoughts that are pretty gruesome. I, I know somebody who, who, who feels that they're going to die in every earthquake that happens. Right? And so these automatic thoughts is the ground starts to shake, I'm going to die. So now we have this false belief that's now growing. Right? So if you've ever experienced a car accident, I had a, I had a sister that experienced a, a car accident, and it was pretty major. And I was young at the time, and she had to go to therapy for it because she couldn't get into a car. And her automatic thought was, every time I'm in a car, something bad will happen. So therefore, I won't get in the car. Therefore, I will not drive. And so all of these automatic thoughts turned into feelings, which turned into resistance. So cognitive behavioral therapy is about learning how to dissect the automatic thoughts. And then it goes into how do you look at that thought that came up. And so just for the sake of it, I'm going to talk about optimism and pessimism. Okay? Um, cognitive behavioral therapy always wants to look at the, op, you know, the, the, the positive side of things. So being an optimist is, is the best way. So if we're looking at the negative, sometimes we have to. But one of the things that I do train my students as much as possible, I oftentimes I'll put a bottle of water, on, a half a bottle of water on the table, and I'll say, your opinion, is this half empty or half full? Almost every time, I, I kind of already know the answer I'm going to get, depending on the student I'm working with. If I have an optimistic student, most likely they're going to say, oh, it's half full. And if I have a pessimistic student, they're going to say, it's, ha it's almost empty. It's halfway empty. So they're going to look at the negative, what, what's been taken out of it. So this is one thing about cognitive behavioral therapy. They want you to look at the positive. Because what happens is the negative thoughts creep in. Negative thoughts creep in. Negative feelings follow. So it's, it goes back to thoughts and feelings. So if a, if a dog bites you, that's a negative, that's a negative uh, uh, action. Now the negative thought is the automatic thought, all dogs bite. And it's a sweeping thing on all the dogs out there, all dogs bite. Well, there is a truth behind all dogs do bite, but not the, all dogs are aggressive. So there's a way to kind of break this apart and understand that not all dogs will hurt you. And so that's what cognitive uh, behavioral therapy is about, is kind of breaking away these, these, uh, these thoughts, these automatic negative thoughts. And what happens is negative thoughts build up into negative re reaction, negative feelings, and then it turns into a negative reaction. And I actually want to get into that. Um, I'm going to sum that up. I'm going to give you an example, and I'll give you an acronym for those who might be taking notes. But to sum up cognitive behavioral therapy, I'll sum it up in two sentences. What we think and what we, f uh, sorry, what we think and what we do affect how we feel. Negative thoughts lead to negative feelings. That's, that's, if you want to take the whole science of CBT, put it all in two, two sentences, those are my two sentences right there. So how does that apply and in, in how is that applicable to our, the real world? If you think of AFBR, a is the action, F is the feeling, B is the behavior, and 4 is the results. I had to look at my notes. I, I do this all the time, but it's getting late for me. All right. So the example is the action, there's an argument with a friend, and the friendship ends. That's the action. That's what happens, the physical thing that takes place. The feeling, I will never have friends again. 
That's that distorted, abstract, negative feeling. The behavior. I'm going to isolate and not make friends so I'm safe from getting my heart broken. The result. Loneliness, isolation, depression. Now, as a therapist, I go right from the beginning. I have to kind of unpack it all, and I start with the action. What happened? We got into an argument. They said they never want to talk to me again. They were upset with me. And then we have to stop it at the feeling. So the feeling is, I'll never have friends again. And so I have to, there's a disbelief. There's, a, there's an automatic thought that now has to be deconstructed. And oftentimes I'll say, well, do you have any friends? Well, yeah, I do have friends. Okay, who are your friends? And we, we just want to take that as a false belief and dissect it. And so they can disprove that. And this is where the critical thinking part of what we need to do with our children. So that their thoughts don't turn into their negative thoughts. Because we all have negative things happen to us. But we don't want those to become negative thoughts. Then all of a sudden they're negative feelings. And then we have a negative behavior attached to it. And that is CBT in, in a nutshell. And the resilience aspect of it all is the, the and that's this is the really kind of the author's solution to the resilience factor is kind to see things as thoughts and feelings and behaviors and what i would like to do is leave you with really this is as the ending of my aspect of this talk is understand that your children are going to make mistakes understand that they're going to have these negative feelings attached to those mistakes and it's your job as a parent, your job as an educator. Your, so if you're a teacher out there and you're teaching students, it's your job to debunk the belief, the false belief that they start uh, attributing to themselves. And you'll see it, you'll hear it oftentimes as, I will never, this will always, all these forever kind of infinity words, you know. Once you hear those key words, you have to stop them. And you have to kind of deconstruct that with them. And once you do that, we can start removing the negative feeling. But also, too, teaching to our children that failure is part of learning. And failure is okay. As long as we attempt, as long as we try, failure is okay. And so I actually spoke with a student today, and his heart was just on getting into USC. And so he's been, he's a senior now, and he put in his early application, and the U, USC has an early admissions, and he thought he, he nailed it. And I was trying to get him prepared for the what if scenario. What if, right? He was, he was shutting me down, and I'm not going to talk about that. So I get an email from him today, and he says, you know, Mr. Bishop, can I, can I meet with you? And I'm like, all right, it's probably about the, UC, the USC application. Of, Sure, no problem. I have an opening such and such time. Come by in my office. And he comes in my office, and he's just wearing basically an emotional wet towel, right? And he is just devastated. I already knew what happened, right? Just You can just tell. And he walks in. And he, he slumps in the chair. I was looking for those infinitive words, those negative infinitive words. So I'm saying, okay, what, what brings you to see me? What, 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 why did you shoot me the email? He says, well, I didn't get in. I said, okay. How are you feeling about that? Well, you know, what happened? When did you get the letter? And, you know, oh, I just feel like a loser. I'm never going to get in any of the universities. I said, like, hold on a minute. So I had to deconstruct this. Because now we've got this never. I'm never going to. So now his resiliency is now he has, he has no resiliency. Uh, now he's just going to drop out of school and he's just going to become a nobody. Right? I, have to, I have to build off of this. So I said, okay. How many other universities did you apply to? Seven others. All right, let's list them. What's your number two school? You didn't get in your number one school. What's your number two school? UC Santa Barbara. All right, next one. UC Irvine. Okay. All these other UCs he throws out. I said, okay, before you call yourself a failure and you're never going to university, how are you going to say that you're never going to do something if you don't know what the other side is doing? Part of this is getting him some hope 
So this is what I, I ask you to do is for your children. You give them hope, right? You give them praise for their attempt, but also too, that hope is that, that optimism, right? We want to give them, this could possibly happen. And in reality, I had to show him facts. So another thing as a parent and as a teacher, I want you to lawyer up, all right? So I'm gonna tell you about lawyers. A good lawyer is not gonna bring the emotion to the court. The judge is not gonna have any part of the emotion. And if a lawyer gets a little emotional with it, because he's trying to influence the jury, the judge will shut him down. Anyone here has ever been in jury duty? Okay, so when you go, you'll see this play out. So the minute that the lawyer tries to use emotion to sway the jury, the judge says, no, 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 you stop that now. And so the, the lawyer has to bring facts. And so once you have a child that's used, you know, that, that has these thoughts and feelings that are all in the negative, and you know these are false thoughts, and it's, your, it's your job to bring the facts to debunk those thoughts. So with that student, and now, and now I told him, I said, what's your GPA? That was the first thing I asked. 4.2. 4.2 GPA, and you're telling me you will not get in a university. I said, I challenge you to come back after your seven, give you letters in the mail that you did not get in. And so that's our, that's our deal as he left my office. So anyway, um, Thank you, thank you for just let, giving me the floor there for a minute. Oh, that was okay. so beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah, I want to first and foremost thank Brother Ali for um, your presentation. So uh, relevant, so powerful. A lot of food for thought that you left us with. And as you were speaking, many things were coming to my mind, but I wanted to just first mention two uh, things that really tie in with you know, the, the portion that I'm going to be presenting, which is the Islamic perspective. Um, what you mentioned about how you uh, uh, introduced the game of chess to your friend, and you basically set him up for the realistic expectation, right? Uh, which is that he will fail. And I think um, that, you know, as a, as a concept is something that we need to first and foremost understand, because in Islam, I was just mentioning earlier, I had a class um, and I was mentioning that one of the, my, I mean, there's many things, obviously, alhamdulillah, that we love about our deen. But one of the things that I love about Islam, and I think we should really take great pride in, is the fact that our deen is so transparent. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has really just laid it all out for us. You know, you read the Quran, you read the, the seerah, you, you, you get the picture. It's all there. There's no secrets. There's no, you know, agendas. There's no hidden plots and twists. Of, and, you know, it's all there. Dunya is difficult. Dunya is hard. You're going to be tested. We're going to test you with your f children, with your spouses, with your f wealth. So all of that is, you know, uh, it sets you up for the right expectation in life, right? Which is why what I was saying before is so important that faith grounds you in, in, in setting yourself up or with the expectation that will align with the reality you're going to have. But when you don't have a faith perspective and then you create a false utopian concept of what life is, right? Because people who don't have faith, they really do see this place as it, right? Like, this is it. I'm going to make the most of it. And so you set your expectation that everything should go my way. And then, and then we have, obviously, in our, you know, in the West here, we have a problem with entitlement. We have a problem with a lot of messaging that gets ingrained into the minds and starts to shape a person's expectations and reality. All of it, which is not set in reality that's the you know ironic thing right that that we're actually falsely portraying you know life by you know by through media for example i mean think about how much of our expectations are shaped through film through television through music right when you're growing up on a diet of messaging that's distorted that's utopian that's not set in actual life real experience but stories you know then you start to think that way and i've seen this when i work with couples i mean this is one of the main points i talk about when we talk about marriage for example and i say 
if you came to marriage thinking that the Bollywood movies that you've been watching, right, or Hollywood rom-coms are like what your expectation is, you know, like your or you know, you're even before that, like your sp the selection of a spouse is informed on the archetypes that you've seen growing up watching all of this television and film, you are setting yourself up to fail and you're setting your marriage up to, to fail because that is fiction. It's not reality. Reality is, yeah, you might uh, have that little honeymoon phase, but all of a sudden you're going to have problems, right? And and we're, we're taught to, to, um, to basically, you know, be very mindful of what affects, you know, what we let in, right? And, and, you know, when you when you ask, you know, how do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our children? We have to go back to the basics, and the basics are: what is the Quranic worldview, right? What is the what is the worldview that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants us to have and ascribe to, and how are we implementing that in our own families, in our own lives, as parents, as educators? What are we teaching our children? Is it in line with the Quranic worldview, which says that, for example, you know, as I mentioned, you will be tested, right? That this life is uh, a, you know, an ex uh, or the dunya is a low place where where you should expect sorrow, anxiety, depression, grief. Like if that's not what your uh, the world that you're um, preparing yourself for, let alone your children, then obviously you're going to fall into everything that they're describing in this book, which is a false expectation based on you know, whatever, whether it's your your entitlement, your false ideas around, you know, the, the narratives that you've uh, envisioned, but it's not true. And so, as you were speaking, I love that because that is part of the solution, that we actually start off our journey as, you know, individuals, obviously, our own selves, that's where, you know, you we start with. You're, if you're not grounded in reality, which is, you know, I have to expect and anticipate that I will have problems, that I will have challenges. But I also have recourse, right? So it's not like I'm just left to suffer. Through suffering, through hardships, we have, uh, we have a, a worldview that is actually quite empowering, right? And the perfect proof of that is to look at the lives of the prophets. So if you're actually studying, you know, the the, the highest of human beings and the and the and the ones that are our exemplars, all of the prophets, but specifically the prophets I said him, and you see that from the onset of his life he had challenge that he had to, you know, overcome after challenge, after challenge, after challenge. But what hap what's the totality of his of his life is that he was the most perfect human being. So those challenges did not in any way take away from him. They actually are part of why he is so incredibly, uh, you know, who, who he is. It's because of those challenges. So, you know, going back to the, the book and those three untruths, I think if we go through every single one of them, you will find Islam has a perfect answer to all of them. The first one, as I mentioned, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Of course it's a lie because I just, you know, we just stated that, that if, if Allah subhanahu is telling you or telling us that this life is difficult and and uh, and hard, and you will go through challenges. However, you know uh, those who are the most patient, those who are the most resilient, those who have sabrun jamil, they practice, you know, that beautiful patience, will come out successful. Then obviously it debunks that lie right away. That actually hardships, right, make you stronger. Um, and again, the proof of that is evident in all of the great. Uh, prophets, the saints, the, the teachers that our deen uh, encourages us to know of and learn about their histories. It's to infuse in us this concept and really get it that actually, um, yes, you can go through a lot of suffering in life, but you can succeed and then come out on top. So not to look at suffering as something that you should fear necessarily or suffering that uh, is something that automatically means that you are uh, disadvantaged. It's actually not true. As we're taught, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests those he loves the most, right? So this is where, as Brother Ali mentioned, using whether it's CBT, which is you know, a modality that therapists use, or what Muslims would use is actually, again, deferring to, to the source that informs us of how to interpret things, right? Because you, if, you, if, we if we're left to our own devices, it's very dangerous. The mind is, um, you know, in, our, in, in Islam we have the concept, for example, that our thoughts are shaped by four sources, okay? So we, we, we call these khawatir or khatir, right? So there are four 
khawatir. There are four sources of inspiration or thoughts that will uh, that all of our thoughts can fall under. The first is khawatir rabbani, okay, which is that it is an inspiration that is directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second is khawatir malakani, so from the angel angelic realm, right, they're positive thoughts. The third is khatir nafsani, which comes from the nafs. And then the last is khatir shaitani, right? So all the thoughts that we have, and I think I've, I mean, I've read studies that say anywhere between 6,000 thoughts a day to even 70,000 thoughts a day, right? Can be understood in this, you know, uh, in this structure, that they fall under one of these four sources, right? Now, again, this is all from our deen. So when we're taught that, that you need to pay attention to your stream of consciousness, make sure that it's passing the truth check. You know, is, there, is this a rational thought? Is this a thought that, that is provable? Is it falsifiable? Is, is there something that to, can counter that thought because it is irrational or it's based on emotion? So that is a process that we can develop internally with ourselves. How do we do that? Again, you look to the deen by process of muraqaba right by process of muhasaba we're supposed to think right we're supposed to be thinking we are our aql which is you know uh, again going back to how rich our deen is because all these questions that uh, i think a lot of people are grappling with in terms of the you know the thinking versus feeling are answered just looking at the way that our deen ha has provided so much context to the, to our creation right like imam al ghazali i mean one of my favorite he has many many wonderful teachings but one of my favorite is also something that is found in in the uh, according to the ancients in in the aristotelian uh, model in the pre even socratic model there was a, they had a very holistic understanding of the human being as being multifaceted, right? So the whole mind, body, heart, you know, connection. But what Imam al-Ghazali introduced and he really helped to explain is that we have three aspects to us. We have the, the he called these quwas, right? So quwat al-aqliya, the intellect, quwat al-ghadabiya, the emotions, and quwat al-shahwaniya, the appetites. So when you understand your, your, your self, in this triune nature and then you realize you know what our deen you know um, instructs us which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the aql at the, the the top of our being right because this should govern everything that we do our aql should be in charge right so you should be rationalizing that's why we're differentiated from all of his other creation the animals are not they're they're instinctual they're not rationalizing anything they feel Animals certainly feel, but they're instinctual, whereas we're rational beings, right? So the the mind is at the top of our, the crown of our in entire structure. Then we have the emotions, which reside in the heart. And the, the analogy that he uses is that emotions, you have to understand them as having a functionality similar to a, a hunting dog, right? If you have a dog that you are, you know, training because you're a hunter or you, ha you know, you're out, you're survival, you're surviving, you need to know how to train the dog and then dispatch it to retrieve what you need and it comes back. So emotions, that's what they should do. Emotions have a function. There's a time to be angry. There's a time to be happy. There's a time to be sad but it should have a function and once the function of it is over like it would be wholly inappropriate if this was a you know a funeral and we're laughing <laughs> right so we need to know that that is not acceptable socially and that we are you know created with an ability to be empathic to have sympathy to grieve and so that's the emotion that should come forward in that you know time and place but this is a rational process right understanding this so the emotions are centered in the heart you train it you and this is where regulation comes from so when he, uh, brother when you were talking about you know CBT and and all of the distortions, right? The cognitive distortions that a lot of us are susceptible to, catastrophizing, you know, or even the opposite of that, minimalizing, right? There's a lot of things that we do as human beings. It's because we're not rationalizing. That's the bottom line. It's an emotional drive that 
leads to those conclusions. But the moment you activate the intellect, which is what our deen is constantly telling us, right? That you are intellectuals. You're, you're created with aql. You should be thinking, reasoning, weighing the pros and cons, weighing the veracity. You know, there's the dua that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to make, which is, you know, Allah, show me truth is truth and falsehood is falsehood. Because we're susceptible to our own distortions and also being manipulated by other people. But the point is, is our aql has to be in charge at all times. So the emotions are based in the heart. You treat them like you would a hunting dog. You train them, you regulate them, and you dispatch them according to the appropriate time and context. The shahwa, the appetites, are likened to a pig. You have to not fall into enslavement of them, right? So we're now, uh, many of our teachers, like Shah Hamza, he's, he's mentioned this before, but it's true that if you look around, you find a lot of what he calls dog people and pig people. They're driven by emotions, which is what we're talking about, right? Everybody's triggered, everybody's sensitive, everybody's fragile, everybody's falling apart. Or they're just giving into their base desires. They just want something, their shahwa leads them. Where are the people that are reasoning? That's supposed to be us, right? The Muslims are put in the position of the khulafa the, or the... Um, yeah, the, 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 the representatives of Allah subhanahu wa deen because we're supposed to be reasoning. And if you really look at historically, this was true, right? Our golden age was, was the age of, what, the dark ages for the Europeans because we were on the rise. And many of these, even these, you know, conveniences that we have today are sourced to the fact that Muslims contributed so much to the areas of science and medicine and all these things. So we are absolutely the vanguards in the trip. You know, we, we were leading the charge for so long because we were doing what we were supposed to be doing. But now we've come here, right? And what's happened? And this is, I mean, I've seen it in my lifetime where as soon as we come to the land of choice and opportunity, what takes hold? Right? How many people do we know who've immigrated here from Muslim lands? They had, mashallah, structure, order. They were praying five times a day. They come here and it's like, whoo, yeah, it's party time, right? Let me just take, like, let, let me just, you know, throw all of that knowledge, all of that out the door because the dunya, and this is, you know, a microcosm of, of what the dunya represents, right? America or the West, with all of its opportunity, with all of its choices, is like a uh, you know, a, a buffet of, 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 of shahwa, of desire. And if you're not in control of yourself and you don't have your, the right understanding of your purpose, then you're susceptible to falling prey to all of the distractions and all of the things that we're seeing so many people around us uh, fall prey to. And this is why when we go back to parenting or educating our children, we've got to remind them of their essence. You are a spiritual being you're, you're, that's, that's in a physical body. You are not a physical, weak to the flesh, right, body that has no spirit. And that's the demonic worldview that they are being indoctrinated in everywhere else in this, in this country or in this world, which is you're just a physical body. Your feelings are all, you know, everything, your whole reality should be shaped around your feelings or your desires. And so the spirit is completely gone. And children are not really being taught that anywhere else unless they come to an Islamic school, unless they have parents who are, really grounded in their deen and remind them you are a spiritual being. You have a high maqam with Allah. You have the ability to rise above the angels. Like, I mean, just think about how powerful that message is for a child. That regardless of your human frailty, regardless of the skin color that you have that you're insecure about, that all these, you know, things, the, the, all the accidentals that this society tells you to focus on, it's immaterial, it's irrelevant because you're by virtue of your character, by virtue of your good deeds, you can s achieve higher than the angelic realm. If we could teach our children to see themselves in that way, then what happens is when they're faced with difficulty, with challenges, they will have a res you know resilience, right? Because they're they're they have they're 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 informed on the truth of their reality. Whereas nowadays, again which is really the big issue, and unfortunately it is affecting our Muslim children. I mean, inshallah, not with families at Peace Terrace, but I've certainly seen it in the community because, you know, they're, chil they're sending their children to public schools where they're not getting any spiritual input or at all, ever. And then, you know, there's no time because you come home, there's homework, there's sports, there's all these other things. So where is where are our children supposed to get this, you know, solid fortification that really reminds them that you have to be strong, that this world is temporal, that there's much more to life, and that yes, you're going to go through things, but guess what? 
all of the best of people have gone through things and we've survived. And the only, like our teachers remind us too, that the only reason why we even exist today, and this is where, um, you know, a, a perspective that's really important to, for us to have too, is to look at the generational resilience that resulted in us being alive today. It was because our ancestors went through famine, went through war, went through horrific marriages, abusive relationships, but maintained their faith identity, maintained their, you know, their, their, they, they had uh, istiqama, they stood. They didn't fall apart because they had this, that, or the other happen to them. That we are standing here today as Muslims, especially those of us who were born into Muslim families. So we have to really appreciate that stoicism, resilience, all these themes that our deen teaches us are part and parcel of being a Muslim and, and, and that's why we're, it's haram to fall into despair. It's haram to let, you know, uh, your, your own machinations, your own false interpretations cast doubt in your Lord, which is what happens to people when feelings just start going sideways and, you know, we're all over the place with our feelings. So regulation of emotion is, is so important and I think the other point I wanted to mention, which I'm so glad you you talked about the game that you were playing with your uh, pay, or with the student that you were working with. It's so funny because just the other day, I had this uh, discussion with my husband. So, how many of you watch Jeopardy in your households? Okay. So we never, I never had t regular television, but with the World Cup, my husband bought YouTube <laughs> Premium or whatever for three months, and so I was like, we're only we watch the World Cup, and I'm not a TV person, but I was like. I love Jeopardy. I'll watch Jeopardy. So Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, right? Those are the two. We watch them and that's it. That's our TV for the day. But I am very competitive. So if you know me, you know I will win. And I will, and I am, yes, I'm a showboat. I'm a braggart because I'm like, it's all about competition. You got to trash talk, you know? If you can do it on the court in basketball, then why not sitting at the house and I'm rubbing it in your face that I want? So anyway, I like to do that. But my husband was getting, um, he, he, he was in the kitchen and he was like, you shouldn't do that because my youngest one was getting like a little, sad you know and he was like pouting because I kept getting the answers right and so I had this debate with him and now I'm so happy that you shared this I'm gonna go and tell brother Ali <laughs> confirmed that what I because I knew I was like the same exact thing I said no I want him to be tested I'm, he, he was telling me to let me let him lose or let lose let, let him win stop answering the questions I was like no I'm not gonna do that I will I will win and I even if I'm playing chess if I'm playing any game I never take the approach of like let me you know soft no I'm gonna, I'm gonna beat you and I'm gonna <laughs> teach you my ways and that's the other thing I, I do that I'm, I'm, I'm generous in that way I will I'll teach them my ways. but I want them to win so I actually you know defended that position and then I had to have that same process processing conversation with my youngest one. I said, listen, the reason why I'm like doing all that is because I want you to feel confident and also to spark that competitive drive in you where it's like, okay, it might not be about mommy. It's just about, I want to do better next time. I don't want to just sit here and pout and feel like, you know, I'm a, a sore loser. So, you know, infusing these types of ideas, even in these transactions that we have with our children every day, they're so important because it will counter this fragility that they're seeing everywhere else in society, right? If we believe in them, if we bolster them, if we remind them that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything can happen. And I've had even my son over the years with different situations, I remind him of dua, the power of dua. Dua is the weapon of the believer. I mean, that's such an important integral hadith for us. If we're teaching our children that, then guess what? When they feel like, okay, like I had my son, he was uh, preparing for, uh, my oldest one was preparing for a big basketball competition. It was like a tournament. And uh, he was really stressed out because he was playing the best team and his team was like, okay. But he was like, so I kept telling him, just make dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. If you just make dua, work hard, obviously practice, do all that, but just make dua. So when, alhamdulillah, they played and he won and it was the biggest shock because nobody thought that their team could beat this other great team. He was like, he came to me with the full confidence, he said, Mommy, I made a lot of dua at, at Fajr time, and right before the game, I did Fatiha, and, I, and he was like, I know that's why I won. And I said, that's exactly, that's, you know, when you have that parenting, like, yes, alhamdulillah, uh, you know, you got it, and I, you know, we, we, but it's, that's the kind of 
messaging that our children need to hear. Not, oh, you're sad, you're triggered, let me coddle you, let me protect you, safetyism, all these things that Brother Ali was talking about, which actually end up doing far more harm. And I actually, you know, I remember, just FYI, I mean, it's a kind of a little footnote, but I remember when I first had my, my, uh, my first, my eldest son, and I was reading about all the parenting philosophies, right? There's the attachment parenting style, then there's a the cry it out method, right? If you look at the research of those two, and you'll find camps. I mean, in my own family, I had people who were like, cry it out, put them in the room and close the door, right? And <laughs> that was not me. I'm too much of an empath. If I hear like a little bit of a, I'm like, oh, you know, so I was like, no, I'm going to do the attachment parenting, right? But when I started doing the research, what did they say? They said that actually, you think that by leaving them in the room and to cry it out that you're going to build these strong kids who are just going to, you know, basically soothe themselves. Whereas the research shows that they end up actually having more stress later in life versus attachment children. So it's, again, challenging these ideas that we have with, with fact, right? Like Brother Ali said, you can't, your, your interpretation, your understanding may seem logical, but is it, really in line with, first and foremost, for us, our criteria isn't just science, but compassion, like to have a baby crying and you're just like, I'm gonna sit and eat my ice cream. Like what, you know? That infant is, is Allah gave them that ability because it has a need, maybe it's in pain. But for some parents, they've been so in conditioned to think that they're gonna do better by their children by abandoning them and leaving them to cry it out like that because it's like, yeah, I wanna have these resilient kids. But the research doesn't prove that, it's the opposite. They actually, cause why you're, you're getting them accustomed to this high cortisol like stress response so they end up actually having far more stressful experiences as adults because they don't feel safe so here is like a perfect example of how these kinds of ideas that are perpetuated and usually because there's you know I, I for me I'm just at a point where everything has to be questioned in this society money drives so much of what is marketed to us and so much of what is sold to us and they're very convincing they're very good at trying to use these you know like these these you know whatever ad, uh, you know propaganda to, to convince us but we have a higher criteria and our criteria is truth it's haq. and if it doesn't align with our dean, it should immediately be abandoned. I don't care how many people are pushing it because if it directly is in opposition to um, uh, you know, a, a core value of our dean, then inherently it's flawed. And this example of like, you know, uh, as I mentioned, lacking compassion toward, a, or toward an infant. I mean, I'm talking newborns are left to cry. Like, I just don't understand how any Muslim could adapt that, adopt that if they were reading the hadith, if they were reading the messages of having compassion towards children, right? It just doesn't make sense, right? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I think that that's one of the things, in terms of going back, that's why we named this forum Ad Fontes, because it's going back to the source, exactly. and going back to the sources of truth and those uh, uh, initial things. Uh, two things I wanted to say, and then I think we need to yeah, open it up to question and answer. Uh, one is the junior, the elementary teachers and I had a meeting today, and, and they were asking me about this and uh, how to actually instill this concept of thinking versus feeling. And so one of the things that I said, any time that a student says, "I feel this," tell them to t to repeat their 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 statement with saying, "I think this because." So instead of con saying, "I feel scared." to say, I think I'm scared because. Mm -hmm. Because when they're, when they're rationalizing it, then you can work with them on that irrational thought, right? right? But when it's a feeling, and they're feeling triggered, and they're feeling that constriction, and they remove their thought from it, they're not going to necessarily do that. So it's just a little trick maybe you guys can also use with, with the kids that uh, when they come to you with anxiety and they're pouring out their feelings, to help them to rationalize it. And then, sorry, go No, ahead. I wanted to piggyback, and I, I just, I so appreciate you bringing that out because it is something that we work with in my office quite a bit, and I use the cause and effect model, right? And so, if anything, I, I, there are so many aspects of clinical therapy, but one of them is behavioral psychology. And behavioral psychology tells us that there's a cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever there's an emotion, right? So if your anger goes up, there's a cause of why, why that one. 
It might be obvious, it may not be, but there's a reason. So I feel angry because, mm -hmm. and so this is a, a very clinical way of, of helping your child go through and explain why they feel the way they feel. So just excellent point. I just, I just was smiling inside. I was like, thank you so much. for." Yeah. <laughs> The other thing that I wanted to say was the concept of us, us versus them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that's really dangerous and kind of permeated our society is this concept of the females versus males, men versus women. Um, so we, we're constantly perpetuating this and have kind of ingrained it that if it's coming from my husband, I'm surely not going to take it. If <laughs> it's coming from the male in my family, this whole concept of us being too, you know, uh, beings that are constantly at odds with each other and and, um, and seeing everything through that lens is a very dangerous lens versus, you know, that and the partnership and the love and reverence that Allah SWT tells us to have towards each other, the option to have towards each other. So I, I just wanted to point out that when we put ourselves into camps, and sometimes those are ideological, political, or whatever, but we also put ourselves into these male-female camps. And, and it, it's a very dangerous kind of place to be in when you're raising a family because you're not, you're consciously not being a one unit and you become like kind of these utilitarian kind of uh, practitioners of, you know, your point of view versus how do we create a cohesive point of view um, within, within our household, within our relationship, within our, our household and then perpetuating those differences with our children as well. So. I just want to make sure that that's a point that we kind of keep in mind that subconsciously or consciously we're always doing that. Can I just quickly add something? Because yeah. I, I wanted to just quickly mention, you know, we talked about the three untruths, right? Which is the what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. That's obviously a lie in our Dean. The second was always trust your feelings. What I was saying earlier about the thoughts, right? And understanding the sources of thoughts. Our nafs is really, you know, it's like a record playing constantly in our minds, right? And that, and it is the greatest of the evils, right? There's four sources of evil in the world. Shaitan, nafs, hawa and dunya, dunya the material world. But the nafs is the greatest evil. So we actually have to be very suspicious of our thoughts and very suspect of our feelings and make sure that you are literally questioning your feelings, questioning presumptions, questioning your, like for example, husnadhan, the concept of, you know, if you, if you, if someone for example didn't invite you somewhere, but you have to, you're, it's on you to make excuses for that person as a rational exercise to get you out of victim mentality. So the victim mindset is not acceptable in Islam. You, you have to be willing to do that. Like what are the rational explanations of why you weren't invited? Do you have to conclude that they don't like you? Or is that maybe an irrational thought that's give, feeding into your own inner weakness or whatever? So rationally do the thought of like, oh, maybe they didn't have my email right. And you do that up to 70 excuses we're challenged to do. That's how much we should suspect, suspect our thoughts. And then the third, as you mentioned, life is a, ba a battle between good and evil. We... I mean, yes, in, in our, in a, from, from, the, from our cosm cosmological understanding of, of the world, there's good and evil. But as uh, Homer said, we have to be very humble to not presume we know who's good and who's evil, right? Like, who are we to make a claim? I, we don't know if we're on the right of any situation. I mean, Imam Shafi said he never met anyone without thinking that they were better than him. That they, were, that they had more truth to the debate than he did. And he actually wanted that. So if we're going to create these polarized world views where everybody is in, like you said, you know, whether it's identity politics or whether it's gender, whatever the issue is, and we fall into these camps of us versus them, that's a supremacy. And supremacy is jahiliya, it's ignorance, it's shaitani. Whereas the Prophet Sallallahu the best of creation, never treated people as though he was the best of creation. So he's our model. So all of these points are in line with, uh, you know, our deen in terms of, you know, what, what we have to infuse in our children. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to kind of full circle that.